please take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, this is what we read in order to even get the context of Hebrews chapter 11. Wherefore, wherefore is uh, also therefore, therefore, saying, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And that great a cloud of witnesses is what is referred to are the witnesses of Hebrews chapter 11. All that we have for the first many, many verses, 1 through 35, are testimonies of victories. When it looked like there was no way out, that there was no hope at all, the Almighty came through at the last second and delivered Israel. One of the greatest testimonies of this uh, you actually see in uh, episode, I believe it's episode number uh, eight of the Root Awakening, the Red Sea Crossing. It's, uh, we also have it at theredseacrossing.com. You can go to that website and watch it. You turn your friends and families onto it. We have literally thousands of these cards that you can pass out that take people to theredseacrossing.com. We give these to you by the hundreds so that you can can get them out in the street. You have a, a touchstone, a way to witness to people. Tell them that they found Pharaoh's chariots and army strewn for a mile and a half on the bottom of the Red Sea under 900 feet of water. We've got it on video. It, it's such an incredible testimony that the Hebrew scriptures are real. But in that particular uh, video, uh, that half hour segment, you see that there is a, an Egyptian war chariot just about 100 meters off from the Midianite shore. That means that 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 war chariot was uh, drawing down on the women and children which were scampering up the other side and just as they raised their harpoon to begin killing these people it says the almighty looked down upon the egyptians and ripped the chariot wheels off and destroyed them right there and just at the last second when it looked like they were going to be taken overtaken by the egyptians the chariot wheels were ripped off and right there you see the deliverance of the Almighty and I, I say the Almighty Yehovah is the master the absolute master of drama when it looks like there's no hope he comes through at the last moment why does he do this I believe is because he wants life to be exciting for us he wants it to look like there is no hope if someone wrote a play just to show what's stronger than hate would they not arrange the stage to look as if the hero came too late? It's almost in defeat. It's, it's looking like the evil side will win. So on the edge of every seat from the moment that the whole thing begins, you have to realize that it is love that wrote the play. It is love that wrote the script. It is the Almighty that writes the plays of our life so that he can show himself strong in these moments of, of absolute terror. But even if he doesn't come through, which we begin reading in 36, it says that others had trials of mockings and scourgings. And when you talk about a scourge, you're talking about a short whip, which is a rod covered with leather that then has leather thongs on it. On the end of these thongs are bits of glass and stone and bone that are tied up in this leather thong. And when this thing is taken across the back of a person and then raked across the back, chunks of flesh, sometimes even chunks of bone come out with that. And when a person is put to the scourge, if they are given 40 stripes, they are really only given 40 stripes save one. 40 stripes because if they actually gave one too many, the scourger then would be put to the same lash. He would get a scourging. And a person that received 39 stripes, many of them, they never lived through it. So we're talking about a brutal, brutal punishment that, that would be inflicted upon these people that sometimes they didn't live through these things. Yea, moreover, they, they, were, they, they were bound, they were imprisoned, they were stoned, they were cut in half, sawn asunder, meaning they were cut in half. This is what happened to Isaiah. Yeshayahu was, was cut in half down in the Kidron Valley because he refused to recant. They were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins. They were destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom this world is not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and they lived in dens and caves in the earth. 
And yet these all, having obtained a good report through faith, they received not the promise. They did not receive deliverance at that time. But they were faithful to the end, and because they were faithful to the end, they have a greater inheritance awaiting for them in the world to come. God having provided some better thing for, for, for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now we get in, into the, the next section here. Seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, now let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, after in this entire book, which is written near the end of Shaul's life, it is written in the last few years of the temples uh, just before it's destroyed. It's written to the Messianic Jews who have been living in Israel. They have seen the nullification of the miracle that was done on Yom Kippur. The scarlet cord never again turned white uh, from the scapegoat that was, that was uh, put out into the wilderness. For the last 40 years, the rabbis tell us it never turned white again from the year 28 of the Common Era when Yeshua was crucified to the year 68 when the rabbis, when those who know when the temple was destroyed, not 70 according to the Pope and his, his yes men, but no. Why do they say 70? Because they keep on trying to get Daniel's prophecy fulfilled. No. The rabbis tell us that from the year that Yeshua's crucifixion took place until the temple was destroyed, the miracle that happened every year on Yom Kippur never happened again. It's the end of Shaul's life. He's in prison. He's about to let Timothy go. It's his last gasping breath, and he's telling us, okay, there's a race that's set before you, so strip down to fighting weight. This is a time to get serious. Any sin in your life that you are harboring, that you think you can mess around with, get rid of it now. This is your last chance because this is a run to the finish line. You have to run it with endurance, though, because it's not for, for Shaul. He was at the finish line. He says, now I know there is a crown of righteousness waiting for me. I know I have made it to the finish line. I have run the race. I have, I have met the challenge, and now I know I've completed it. But he's saying to us, you've got a long way to go, brother, and you better not mess it up. Run that race, it's an endurance race. The word patience is endurance. Run the race with endurance. Looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, see, we, we look at him and we, we see he is our example, the author and finisher of our faith. What does that mean? The author and finisher, the word our is not there. The author and finisher of faith. See, how do you say that he's the author of faith? I, you know, it, it, it is, uh, this figure of speech work, works well. You look up faith in the dictionary, and whose picture do you see? It's Yeshua. You look up the epitome of faith, and what is it? Here is the author. This is what faith is. This is the one who completed his mission because of faith because he saw the prize that was set before him. There is no greater example in our lives of someone who was tortured for doing the right thing and held on and did the right thing. Not my will, Father, Father but yours be done. You know, if there's any way, I would rather not run this race. I would rather not have to go through this course. I would rather just you know, just if there's any way. But he said, but I'm not here to do my will. I'm here to do your will. And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the torture 
on that Roman execution stake. And I will tell you, no more gruesome, painful means of execution has ever been dreamed up by the sick, twisted mind of man than crucifixion. It would take up to a week to be tortured to death on a cross. Yeshua didn't last that long with all that he had been through. He despised the shame. He treated the shame as if it was nothing. He, 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 he held absolutely no respect for the shame that was heaped upon him. Why? Because he then sat down on the right hand of God. And now we're right back to where Hebrews started out, Hebrews chapter 1, because here we are in Psalm 110, Yehovah said unto Adonai, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. He makes him a promise that you sit down on my right hand, one day you are going to rule over these people with the rod of iron. And he knew that if he stayed faithful, that he would do it. What is the scene in the book of the Revelation? It is a scene in heaven that the, that the, 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 the beast shout out holy so loud that the rafters of the universe shake. And then, in the right hand of the Almighty is a scroll that is sealed with seven seals. And the cry goes out from that strong angel, this mighty angel, that no one has the authority to strip the seals. And John begins weeping uncontrollably. There is no hope. It is like a, a funeral dirge chord hits the entire universe. There is no hope. And he begins to weep uncontrollably. The Almighty has the title deed of this earth. He gave Adam the, the dominion, the authority, the power over all this earth. And Adam relinquished it to Hasatan. And is now bound with the cords of his authority. No one can take it away from him. He won it legally. It was handed over to him by uh, Adam. Adam was given this world. He was the king of this world. And he handed it over by an act of high treason. And now the Almighty has it in his hand and no one has the authority to loose those seals. It's over. It's done. And as John weeps before the throne, then... The angel says, wait, wait, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God has prevailed and he alone is worthy to unloose those seals. Why? He did the father's will. He won it back because they killed the innocent blood. He was raised from the dead and he alone has the authority to strip Satan's authority because he will rule this earth with a rod of iron. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father until he is given the go-ahead to take the earth. Ah, oh, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, he endured such contradiction of sinners. And this is not contradiction like somebody's arguing with them. This is, this is contradiction. This is sinners, evil people standing against him in opposition. It's in opposition, just not contradicting him verbally. No, he's standing in opposition. Just now consider him for just a minute. He stood against every power and authority of the religious world and he refused to back down. He refused to compromise with them. He would not follow the Takanot Masim, the Pharisees. They said, you come up to Jerusalem and you're a dead man. Why do your disciples, why do you teach your disciples to not wash their hands and recognize the authority of the rabbis? Yeshua said, why do you break the commandments of God by your Takanot? None of those 
5,000 that he fed with those, with those loaves and fishes. Not one of them washed their hands with a two-handled pot and said, Blessed are you, O Lord of God, King of the universe, who, who is sanctified by your commandments, commanding us to wash our hands. Because the Almighty never commanded us to wash our hands. And the rabbis themselves say, No, he didn't command us, but we say you have to. And when you obey us, you're obeying him. Yeshua said, oh yeah? Well, let me feed 4,000 more people in front of your sick, twisted face, and they're not gonna wash their hands either. He didn't compromise. He didn't say, oh, we're just gonna keep the, the modern Jewish calendar because we wanna have unity with our brothers. I don't want unity with people who are disobedient. Period. He took a stand. Are you gonna be a limp-wristed little Twinkie and not take a stand? Consider Yeshua. Consider the man who when you look in the dictionary under faith, they've got a picture of him there. Lest you be weary and faint in your own minds. Because if you don't keep your eyes on him, when you see the crap hit the fan, you are going to go down. When you see Babylon go down, and everything that is based on Babylon, every dime that you've got in Federal Reserve notes, your, your one million Federal Reserve notes that you've got saved for your retirement can't buy you a loaf of bread at a 7-Eleven. When you see that go down, if you do not have your eyes on the Messiah, you will crater. It's going to get scary out there. He's going to shake everything that can possibly be shaken. Let's continue on. You've not re yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. He's saying, you know, it hasn't cost you your life. It cost him his life, but you haven't paid the death penalty. Consider what he's done. And remember, he is our example. That is faith. That is faith. Because we know the same one that raised him from the dead is able to raise us from the dead. As a matter of fact, he gave that authority to Yeshua. Yeshua is the one who will raise the dead. Not the Father. Yeshua has been given the authority. And he will send his angels to do the job with him. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of Yehovah, or the correction. Let's say correction. Chastening, that's old English. It's correction. He is going to correct you. If you are in the wrong, he will correct you. Don't faint when you are rebuked of him. Don't go get all coward, you know, when you get whacked down and he puts your feet on a different path. Realize that, you know, this is what happens. For whom Yehovah loves, he corrects. And he scourges every son he receiveth. Wait, hold on. The word scourge is wrong here, all right? No, he paddles their fanny. He does not take a whip with bones in it and rake it across your flesh and bring you to the point of death, okay? He, is, he, he, he made the, the dairy air to be a nice spot that is well cushioned and it's made for a paddle, okay? He is going to use a rod and he is going to paddle your fanny, all right? He's not going to scourge you and draw away chips of blood and bone and, and all that, okay? Every son, he corrects. He paddles their fanny. It says in one of the ancient Hebrew texts of the book of Hebrews. Okay. <clears throat> if you endure, endure this correction, God deals with you as sons. For what son is he that the father doesn't paddle his rear end except for the son that threatens to call child services when he's laying in the middle of the supermarket floor, turning blue, holding his breath, kicking and screaming, knocking stuff off the shelves. These are the only people that are now protected, okay? Continue on, people. Here we go. 
If you are without correction, whereof all children are partakers, then you're bastards. You're not sons. If he is not correcting you, then don't worry. You're not even a son. If you don't see you, when you get off the track, if you don't see him coming after you, you better worry because that means you're a bastard. You don't belong to him, okay? You think you're his son, but you're not his son. That's where you get worried. Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and gave, and we gave them much reverence. You know, remember when our dad took off his belt and wore it off, wore it out on our rear end? Did we respect him afterwards? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I am now, okay. I'm not even going to begin telling you the stories I could tell you, okay? I know what a woodshed is, and I don't know if there was ever any wood in that woodshed, but I saw it several times. I know where it is. It's right out back of my granddad's, you know, the big house, okay? Furthermore, We've had, okay, we've had fathers which after the first corrected us, we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto our spiritual father and live because he's correcting us? Oh yeah, we ought to respect him for it too. For they barely for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. And I think sometimes I got paddled because, you know, my dad really liked doing it. Maybe he got cranky and he... And he, he unscrewed the antenna from a portable FM radio, the steel antenna, and he took it to my rear end for bringing a seven-foot blue racer to a family picnic, okay? I remember that, and I think my dad took great pleasure in bending that because for the rest of my life, I remember that FM radio, that Silvertone radio had a bent antenna, shaped like my derriere, okay? But he, he does it for our profit. He does it just for our benefit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. As he says, be ye holy as I am holy. Be ye kadosh. He is kadosh. We are to be holy as he is holy. This is a standard that he will bring us to if we are sons. Now, no chastening or no correction for the present time seems to be joyous, but no, it's rather grievous. A lot of screams and shrieks and, uh, and the screams of terror. Uh, afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. If we learn from the correction, then everything is just fine. Okay, from then on, guess what? I never brought seven-foot blue racers to family reunions anymore. Okay? Everybody had peace after that. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see Yahovah. If we are not holy as he is holy, if we do not get our garments cleaned up with the sick, twisted garments of sun, pagan sun god worship, if we do not eschew the evil, hate the things he hates, and love the things he loves, if we say, well, that's not really what Easter means to me, and I'm just going to keep doing all these pagan things, even though they're an abomination to him, if you think that he's going to let those who willingly disobey him into his presence, then you don't know the God of the Bible. You know, if you think that, you know, you know, just writing in here, I did this prayer on this date, that's, that, that's your ticket to heaven. If you think that's your ticket to heaven, then try taking that page with you. If you show up there and you've got that page, they'll say, well, you're the first person that got to take it with them. That's what he's going to say. But to the rest, he said, only those who do the will of my Father. I don't care if you call me Lord. I don't care if you have proclaimed my name to the ends of the earth and think you've cast out devils in my name and done wonderful works in my name. You haven't. Get out of my sight. These are terrifying words. And so to be holy as he is holy, this is what we are called to. In verse 15, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. The word looking, no, no, it's, it, it's uh, 
looking, it is shomer, it's watching, it's guarding, guarding diligently. You know, in Hebrew, it would be shomer. It's not looking, but it's watching. You know, watchtower, or keep, keeping, or guarding diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. And how do you fail the grace of God? See, grace is the divine empowerment to do exploits. What are exploits? Exploits are defined in the Marine Infantry version of the Bible as that which would make James Bond cringe in a fetal position under his bed. That is what exploits are. As Daniel says, those that know their God will be strong and do exploits. This is what it's talking about here. If we fail of the grace of God, he is calling us to do exploits. He has empowered us by his Holy Spirit. As, as you heard, as Kenny was talking about this, you know, in the middle of the night, told exactly what to do, in his jammies, told exactly where to go, who to speak to, what the situation was. The man is gonna kill himself, he makes the decision. What did he do that night? He did an exploit. Do you think that James Bond would have gotten out of his jammies and gone down and done that? No, he would have feared because he doesn't know the voice of the Almighty. He would think that he's crazy if he heard that. I really want him to tell the story about his wife, how, how maybe next time you have to tell the story of how you got your wife 20 years ago. The revelation to get on a plane and go to another country unbelievable. No, it's believable because this is how the Spirit of God works. He wants to instruct us. And if he doesn't, then we have to say, okay, something's wrong, and I want, I want that reality. I want to know that I'm hearing his voice. I don't want to make things up because I know people who make things up all the time. The Lord says this, and the Lord says that, and the Lord says another thing, and they never do it. And as soon as someone says, the Lord tells me something, they don't do it, then I stay way away from that person because I don't want to get hit by a stray lightning bolt. So, you watch diligently so that you do not fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby you are defiled. Because, you know, if, if you have bitterness that wells up in you, that is going to stifle the spirit of the living God. Because there will be disappointments, there will be chastisements, there will be times when you will get your fanny paddled out there. And if you then turn bitter, then you will not hear from him. Because it's not his fault. He is treating you as a son and as a daughter. You know, get used to it, okay? He loves you, and that is why, uh, how you know he loves you. Lest there be any fornicator. The word fornicator is uh, any, uh, anyone, any sexual pervert, okay? Let's say involved, those involved in unauthorized sexual activity. It is called an erva matter in the Torah. That's what it's talked about. Fornication, the word fornication is legally defined in every one of the 50 states of America there are 46 distinct different definitions, however. So you can't go by even an American definition of fornication. You have to go by an erva matter. What is an erva matter? It is a man having sex with his father's wife. Okay? Or with his neighbor's sheep. Or a woman with another woman. A man with another man. These are abominations. Oh, I know that our president has now sanctified marriage between, oh, I don't know, what is it now? Men and dogs and chickens or what? Oh, is it just men and men right now? Oh, don't worry, because, you know, Muslim countries, they have trouble with men and sheep all the time. It's part of the culture. It's part of the culture, okay? And when it's not, it's men with young boys. They actually buy these young boys. Oh yeah, National Geographic. Watch the dancing boys of Afghanistan. All these Muslim men, they all buy these little Muslim boys and when they're through with them and they don't obey them anymore, they kill them. That's what goes on. There is no decency without the Torah. And if Jesus did away with the Torah, 
Okay, then you can all become Muslims and have your way with the chickens and sheep. That's sick. One day we'll not be in a presidential election. I can forget all this, okay? Someday we'll just have a, like a Mormon in or something. We can all calm down. <laughs> that is what it's talking about. Lest there be any fornicator, sexual pervert, or profane person, as Esau, who, who for one morsel of, of meat oh, oh, sold his birthright, okay? So, okay, you know, all you have to do, oh yeah, I just want this one thing. I just want this one besetting sin. Okay, just let me do this one sin and, and, and say it's okay. Oh, that's what Esau did, okay? For just one pleasure, he sold his birthright. Do you get it? He sold his eternal inheritance because he wanted the pleasure for that moment. Be ye holy as he is holy. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he no, found no place of repentance, so he sought it diligently with tears. He was broken up, but it didn't matter because it's too late. He sold his soul for a morsel of meat. He sold his soul for his religion. For you are not come unto the mount that might... Oh, okay, let's read it, King James, first because it's wrong. For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. No, no, it's, the King James is missing the double negative. For you have not come unto the mountain that might not be touched. Okay? That mountain that burned with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, the voice that they heard entreated, that the words should not be spoken to them anymore. And this is all detailed in the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy and the 20th chapter and the 21st chapter of Exodus. When they came to the base of the mountain that no one was allowed to touch, that burned with fire and blackness and thunder and the trumpet sounded and people backed up when the voice of the Almighty shouted down the commandments and they said, please, don't let us hear the voice of the Almighty again. We are afraid we're going to die. He says, you haven't come to that mountain. Those things were written for your learning that you, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. You need to understand this, but that's not the mountain that you've been brought to. And it goes on to says that, that you could not endure it, that those commandments. And, and, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it was going to be stoned or thrust through with, with, with a javelin. You know, nobody could touch it. That's why I say they missed that double negative uh, from, the, from the Greek text, which was in the original Hebrew here. And so terrible was that sight that Moses said, I, even I, quaked exceedingly and was in fear. But you have come unto Mount Zion. You have come unto the city of the living God, unto the heavenly Jerusalem. And, and this is where we are going to. We are not going to that mountain. We are going to the real Mount Zion. We are going to the heavenly Jerusalem. We are going to enter into an assembly, a company of angels. And if you think that you can go in there with your stinking filthy garments of paganism and celebrating your pagan sun god worship festivals and thumbing your nose at the Almighty, refusing to keep his Sabbath and obeying the Pope, if you think you're going to come up to that mountain in the presence of Almighty God and he's going to say, oh, well, it's just okay, then you've got another thought coming, buddy. I kind of paraphrase this because I don't have time to read it all. You're coming in front of verse 24, Yeshua, who is the mediator of the renewed covenant. He paid for it with his blood. And if you think you're going to go up there and say, well, it doesn't really matter. The Torah was wasn't really written on my heart. I said, well, thank you for the admission. Get out of here. Because the renewed covenant is the Torah is written on your heart. You want to do it. You don't say, do we have to keep the feast? 
No! See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on the earth, when they refused to obey Moses, ha <laughs> ha if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven, woe unto us, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but this next time I'm going to shake the heaven. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, so the things that cannot be shaken will be the only things that remain. Therefore, Verse 28, we, receiving this kingdom, which cannot be moved, let us have grace. Let us live with this grace, whereby may we, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Let me close in prayer. Yivarechecha Yehovah v'yishmarecha. Yair Yehovah panavelecha v'chanecha. Isaiah Yehovah Panavelecha Vesem Lechad Shalom Vashem Yeshua HaMashiach Sar Shalom Yehovah bless you and keep you Yehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and may he do it in the name and under the authority of the Prince of Peace Yeshua our Messiah our Savior and our King For more information, visit www.arudawakening.tv or call 1-888-766-3610.